should we talk politics <laughs> uh no thank you so much for coming and uh, thanks for even listening to the earlier session uh we'll talk about a lot of things but one thing i'm generally top of mind curious about the many sports people who retire and they become coaches but very few i mean i can't even i mean hardly become a brand like you like you are known like people know your name uh, you are out there how do you think that has happened and why do you think that has happened um well when i won the all england in 2001 mic closer yeah when i won the all england in 2001 um i kind of ref was reflecting back on what i did and uh, some of the things made me feel that what i have done has been good but it can be replicated because today when i look at um, the sport and when you talk about sport people talk about sport science nutrition physiology psychology these are the problems which people encounter but when i won the all england i had a journey where going to the stadium watchman i and i and i that was a problem you go into the stadium current hai and i was the problem shuttles hai and i coach hai and i so the basics were not there and i could win the all england so in my mind it was like if i can win the all england and i had about three knee surgeries by then if i can win the all england maybe many others can and that is literally the only reason why i actually started to coach because i felt a lot of them around me had the potential and when i was playing and a lot of them when i was finishing my career actually had the career had a prospect to be world level so i just took up coaching with that in mind okay well you've done a lot of things you're most famous for badminton um you're most famous for saina uh, but we know that you've done a lot of things firstly it's not just badminton and it's not just the olympics it's paralympics uh you've been doing things in mizoram you have some very interesting slides which will be very interesting for you guys to see you've been spotting talent moving to other sports what are you most proud of and if you could just tell us things that are keeping you passionate these days because the olympics are over now <laughs> <laughs> well i think um, it's a whole journey for me sport has been everything in my life but for me olympics is not everything of sport the way sport transforms lives is important many people look at sport and say many things but many of them only look at the shine of sport the reality of sport is kind of left off to get a grounds grassroots level picture um i remember i have my um friend coach uh, ramesh sir also here i remember having trained with him and some of the women actually would really love to see this transformation because i remember training going to training and some of the girls were actually missing in training for a few days and i asked them what went wrong and the answer was something which really shocked me and uh, which even today brings tears to my eyes because the answer was they can't afford napkins so they can't come few days in a month and these were national level athletes training and playing for the country literally and this was the state of indian athletics in 2000 or this is the way i remembered it so when i won the all england when i had a chance to do something we organized some training camps and gave money and i'm happy that many of those girls got jobs and that is the big achievement it's not the olympics which gave me happiness it's that lives which were changed which gave me life back in the day in 2016 uh, when a company called maitra uh, vikram and ravi kailash they came up to me and asked for me to come to their office to give a lecture i said why should i come 
and i would rather not come and help something else do something else because it's not worth it but i asked them something if you do my athletes a favor i will actually come to your office and give a corporate talk and they said yes and we started off with a bunch of 10 athletes then later it became 40 in 2017 and if you actually see from that group of people we've had duti chand who won two medals at the asian games of course she was already a player by then but if you see uh, jyoti araji who won an asian games hurdles medal silver medal in the last asian games she was part of it her father is a security guard agasari nandini who comes from a social welfare school and um, who won a bronze at the heptathlon in the asian games last year whose father is a t bandi that's the man this girl deepti jevanji who won the para olympic gold uh, para olympic bronze this this time around her father was a laborer in warangal she was part of that group in fact there are people in the group who are his ramesh sir but there are people in the group who were actually collecting firewood in badrachalam forest rajita who's actually been fourth at the junior world championships this is uh, sri teja who is from a tribal village um this is deepthi uh, deepthi uh, on the corner but there's are these girls who are actually coming from absolute poverty who made a name for the country and that's been phenomenal we look at the shine of sport but the reality of sport i think uh, shanmukha srinivas you see him his photograph picking up paddy bags because he couldn't afford food during the covid times we sent him home from the hostel he couldn't afford because his parents father is not there and he had to fend for his family and for 500 bucks he was actually put picking up and he is the under 23 national champion in 200 meters each of these events i have seen a lot of corporates work hard and tell you that they have really worked hard but trust me what they have gone through you have not gone through the pain which they have gone through the suffering which they have gone through the passion which they have pushed this event is un unparalleled and today they are struggling they have always struggled in this journey for three square meals and they have brought glory to our country we are talking about a deepthi or a jivanj or a yaraji today but truly the moments when their parents have supported them with little of whatever the little they have they had 100 rupees they have spent all the 100 on them i think that very few people have done and they have actually got us the name for the country not many of us in the corporate schooling structure so this gives me an immense pleasure this gives me going it's a fantastic journey for me badminton has been a huge journey 1994 we started off i remember i was the number one player in the country we were not sent to the commonwealth games because the government norm was that you have to be in the top 6 nations in the commonwealth games and we were not fitting that criteria 30 years later we become the thomas cup champions to be the world champions of men's badminton and last year we won the asian women's team championships that i believe is transformation which we have been able to see 2018 after my uh, olympic medal with sindhu we had a email facebook request and we started a program in mizoram in 2019 20 we lost time because of covid in spite of it 872 kids play badminton in mizoram and last year's under 17 national champion lal tajwala is from mizoram from a state 
which never had anybody reach the pre quarter finals of a nationals forever so i think there have been stories which have actually helped transform people transform communities and basically telling us that we have the potential to become huge in the world and i think that's what keeps me going and that's what's truly been something which is very gratifying and very satisfying for me in my work yeah that that is an incredible journey i have two questions actually for, on the first on the uh, on the tribal and the people from really underprivileged backgrounds and the second is on your olympic winners first question is how do you like there is millions and millions of people in india with those backgrounds how do you spot the talent then it's like literally finding a needle in a haystack that somebody speaking firewood somewhere and they end up becoming a champion do they come to you do you go looking for them how is the talent spotting done and then i'll come to the second question later but maybe just answer this well i think uh about 3 years back uh, we had um, kiran from the united group they had come for me to become the brand ambassador to their sporting event which started off as a conversation which led them today to actually have 40 rural centers in the badrachalam forest in Shri shrikakulam in karim nagar in warangal in the interior places where we have athletes former athletes who actually worked really hard but couldn't make a life out of sport who were very depressed and wanting and searching for a job such kind of people we found identified and in their native places we've actually given them a salary and then they become the architects of a small ecosystem which they develop for we train them for a week we send them back we mentor them we as in there is a group of people headed by dronacharya uh, ramesh garu and we they go into the forest into people and actually try to bring them to training in those places we give them very little nutrition it's not those fancy bars which we eat it's basically peanuts literally peanuts jaggery and and bananas and eggs and with that actually they come with the lure sometimes for food but actually we try and pick talent from there it's been a very successful model because we have many champions who have come there probably millions of them or hundreds lakhs of them in the in our country in those pockets i think it's very important that we actually go find them and uh, we need to have a system which can actually bring them to the top and that is, that would be important okay okay so the one is finding the talent the next is you need to polish that talent right and polish 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 till they reach potentially one day at the olympic stage stand on the podium and that has happened for you multiple times uh it's very rare still for anybody in the world to win a olympic medal and i think i i'm very curious to know because you are a coach i mean the players can give their own reasons how they made it but for people who are not a sports person most people watching this are not sports people but they are working in an office or they are studying for an exam or they are just having some goals in the gym i don't know and if they want to reach that ultra high level of excellence which is like the olympic level of championship or at least try to be like they want to be ceo one day or they want to be a big businessman one day or they want to be have a great body one day become a topper one day what does it take what does it take like you said you you have no idea what they go through what does it take to become a champion passion i think an obsession is what is needed a drive so deep that every waking our minute second you dream of becoming that it's very important it's about believing that the unbelievable is possible the impossible is possible you have to believe to be mad enough to realize that the what you're pursuing might never happen 
but you cheat yourself to believing that it is definitely going to happen. I think that needs a kind of a madness, a kind of an obsession, which is very critical in this journey. A rational mind cannot get there because you're talking about one in an entire world. So to be in that level, a rational mind is not. A plan B is not what is wanted. A plan A is the only plan which you have and all your energies after repeatedly failing and people telling you it's not possible, you're still going to pursue it, believing that you are going to do it this time and this time and this time forever. I think that kind of a madness is what is needed for you to get to that level. Wow. And not everyone has it. And tell me something, the flip side of this is when it doesn't happen, it must be really disappointing. I mean, it, emotionally to deal with that. In fact, uh, let's take a very specific example and I want your perspective, but the whole country got involved in that. Uh, we had Vinish Fogart, who was guaranteed a silver, good shot at gold. It was just there, one fight away, few minutes of, you know. And then she didn't lose, but she didn't what they call make weight. They, she, and it was a hundred gram thing. And it's... It's apparently, I didn't know this, I had to learn that the wrestlers have to meet the weight category. They eat a lot, they're normally more than their weight and just on the day of the weighing, they cut, 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 run, sweat, not eat and they do it. How, how would a coach and the player itself, when that happens, when you've been like, that's all you've been thinking about every waking hour, you finally reach that stage and over this, I would call it a technicality. Um, it doesn't happen. How would how would that be? It would have been, and how would they deal with it? Well, I think sports is probably the, the only one which is actually teaching you about failure the best. A ten-year-old comes on the field and loses in front of people at a young age, and he gets up the next day morning to fight again. I think the seeds of fighting actually come from that perspective. The seeds of getting up after failure come up from there. So many sports persons are trained to deal with failure. They're trained to believe that they're going to win, which is actually in many times a cheat by itself. But they're also trained to actually get up each time. And I think that's a very important part of training which people go through day in and day out. And I think that keeps them in steadfast when they actually get to a point like this of, of absolute disappointment. They still get up and pick up their life together and start another day fresh, thinking that tomorrow will be different. And I think that madness is what is ingrained in a true sports persons and that is what actually Vinesh probably had to go through. For many of us who, who won't understand what 100 grams means, I think it's literally the first time you make it, you, you would see boxers, you would see wrestlers, judokers, uh, weightlifters, they at the weightlift, at the cafeteria or the uh, food place at the Olympics and you would see them, they never eat. It's not that they overeat, they never eat. They're probably eating five to six kishmish or dry fruit and that's all they're eating. And literally to put things in perspective, they would like we, if I, they were to put me through a weightlifting or a uh, boxing or a um, wrestler's diet plan, I would probably lose 8 kgs within 4 days. That's literally how much they would squeeze you. They're literally running, they're putting on jackets and running, they're putting, they're on a bicycle cycling and then they're drinking electrol and then throwing it off. They're not even getting to drink and literally people would carry them out and stretch them because there's nothing left in their bodies. You're thinking there's something, there's not even after spending hours 
in the gym and the sauna, they're probably sweating few few drops. So they're almost like a dried fruit. They have nothing left. So I think there's a lot of torture which goes in a weight loss. And I'm I'm sure she must have gone through hell to probably that night to actually lose that three, four hundred grams. And that hundred probably was just not possible because there's nothing left in there to give up. And I think that's what uh, an athlete wow. goes through. Well, she did go on to fight an election and won. So yeah, you're that's right. That's the she easier did. job. Well, that's the easier job, trust me. <laughs> well, we'll have to ask the politicians <laughs> whether they agree or not. But yeah, she did live to fight another day. Thanks, Fulila. That was very insightful and helpful and motivational for all of us. Thank you.